Here's our video lecture for chapter 11 where we're learning the topic of equity. If you remember equity was part of the accounting equation. Assets, all the things that the company owns like those cash, receivables, inventory, even the property plan and equipment are equal to the liabilities both current and long term. Long term like those bonds we learned in the past chapter plus the shareholders or stockholders equity. And in past chapters we saw the capital stock account representing the investment made by the owners and the retained earnings. This is the accumulated profits of the companies in four past years. But we're going to see here in chapter 11 there's more accounts, more detail than these two accounts we've seen in past chapters. Now before taking a look at a corporation well, let's take a look at the corporation, at least the ownership. The owners are called shareholders or stockholders. And you could have just one or thousands of shareholders or stockholders for just one corporation. And another type of business entity would be a partnership. where you have to have at least two or more owners. Could be thousands, but here I just showed two for one partnership. And the simplest type of business entity is called a sole proprietorship owned by one person, the sole proprietor. Here's the sole proprietorship. So these two businesses are unincorporated versus a corporation. Now to be a corporation or partnership, at least here in Hawaii, you have to be recognized by the state government. And the place to go, or at least online, is Hawaii's Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, the Business Registration Division, where you have to fill out some forms and probably get some attorney's help to uh, draft up your legal documents. Now, what's getting more and more popular is a business entity called a limited liability company, where you could have just one owner, and if that's the case, you're probably treated for accounting and tax purposes like a sole proprietorship. Or if you have two or more owners for your limited liability company, probably you'll be treated more like a partnership. A limited liability company has the benefits of probably both a corporation and unincorporated businesses. So the thing to do if you're planning to start off your business is to check out this type of business entity, a limited liability company that I believe is just briefly mentioned at the beginning of our textbook, probably in chapter one. So let's take a look at the benefits and disadvantages of a corporation. Here we're told that a corporation is a separate legal entity from the owners. In other words, the corporation itself can own property, own assets, or can borrow money under its own name. Here it says that the stockholders, stockholders are limited in liabilities of the business. So creditors of the corporation can only go after the assets of the corporation and not assets of the owner. This is unlike the case of a partnership or sole proprietor. If anything goes wrong in those two types of business entities, the creditors can go after the owners. So probably this is the main purpose of incorporating a business, especially one that has some risk, to limit the liability of the owners. But now, remember that LLC, Limited Liability Company, also has this limited liability benefit for the we call them members. The owners are called members of the LLC. Transferring ownership is relatively easy for the case of a corporation. All you have to do is um, exchange the stock, give stock to the new owner. Or in the case of a partner as a sole proprietor, basically you're changing the business when you change a partner or change the owner. But that's not the case for a corporation. Which ties into this one here. If the owner passes away, the corporation is still there. But in the case of a partnership or sole proprietor, it's basically discontinuing the old business and maybe starting up a new one. Here, lack of mutual agency. In other words, the shareholders of your company, stockholders, cannot go uh, enter into contracts for the corporation. It's only authorized employees of the corporation that can do that. And you as a shareholder or stockholder does not necessarily make you a uh, employee of the company, just an owner. 
Here it says, it's easy to raise money, which is relatively true for large corporations. But in the case of a small corporation, probably the owner has to guarantee maybe any borrowing of money. Otherwise, you would not be able to borrow in the first place. Okay, so here they list it down as advantages. Now a disadvantage of a corporation is that there's more regulations, like that filing with the government to be recognized, and there's annual reporting also with the government. But the key disadvantage to a corporation is double taxation. So let me illustrate that. So here is the shareholder again that owns the corporation. And the corporation, as we've been discovering throughout the semester, hopefully has some net income, profit that it's making. And this corporation has to pay taxes. So here, going to the government is some taxes. Hopefully that still leaves some profit left over here for the corporation. So now the corporation can pay out some dividends to the shareholders. But this dividend is going to be income that the shareholder has to report on their own tax return and pay taxes again to the government. So here's the net income being taxed to the corporation and any excess net income being paid out as a dividend to the shareholder. Now the shareholder has to pay taxes on that same income. We call that double taxation in the case of a corporation. But in the case of a sole proprietorship, or partner, again they own the um, sole proprietorship or a par partnership down here. The sole proprietorship or partnership does not pay any taxes, but all of the income is going to be reported each year on the owner's tax return, and they have to pay taxes on the full amount, even though they may not get any distributions. Maybe it's just kept here in the business. But the advantage here is that there's only one tax on the whole income at the owner level because the business entities down here, sole proprietorship and partnerships, do not pay income taxes. A corporation pays income taxes. The shareholders pay income taxes on any dividend distributions. Okay, so again that's a disadvantage to a corporation, the double taxation. So here's the organization chart for a corporation. At the very top are the shareholders who elect directors for a board. Within the board then they would select a chairperson. Now it's the board that hires the officers of the corporation. Okay. Now for very small companies the shareholder is probably on the board. The shareholder probably is going to be the CEO or president of the company. And they may probably hire the family members to do all of these types of uh, positions down here. So one of the main things that get confuses a lot of students in this chapter is the difference between shares, that's like pieces of paper, and the amount of dollars recorded on our journal entries and financial statements. So here, this is part of the balance sheet of a company. Remember we have assets and liabilities and stockholders equity section. And now one of the main accounts every corporation has is called common stock. Every corporation should have common stock. We'll see some corporations later on will have something called preferred stock also. Now you have to register with the government and at that time you ask permission to sell shares. So here it's called authorized shares. This is the permission we have to sell 250 million shares. Now the actual shares sold by the corporation is called issued, okay, sold. Of that 250 million we could sell, we actually sold only 92 and a half million. Again, the amount of shares sold is called issued. And we would take this number of shares issued and multiply it by an artificial dollar amount called par value for one share of stock. Just to be able to record the dollar amount in our accounting records, the company would artificially assign, when they first incorporate, the par value, the amount to record for one share of stock. In this case, it's one cent. So sitting in the common stock account is this amount of shares 
times one cent or $925,563. Now you want to probably sell, the corporation probably wants to sell shares of stock for more than a dollar, for as much as you can get. But this is the amount that goes into the common stock account, the par value. Again, what connects the amount of shares issued with the dollar amount in the stock account is this par value. The simplest par value could be as simple as one dollar. So that means the amount of shares issued is the same amount of dollars inside of the common stock account. So we've just talked about par value. Now there's sometimes stock with no par value, but in its place, and it sounds silly because it still works the same way as par value, no par stock is probably going to be assigned st a stated value amount. And sometimes, and this is what you would put inside of the common stock account for the dollar amount. But sometimes there's no par and no stated value. So whatever money you do receive when you sell the stock, all of it would go into the common stock account. I don't think we have an example here in our slideshow, but we may have one in our homework assignment. No par, no stated value. So here we have stock with a par value of $2 for one share. We're going to sell or issue 100,000 shares. Now you want to sell it for more than $2. You want to sell it for as much as you can. And in this case, we sold it for $25 a share. But what goes into the common stock account is the number of shares sold, 100,000, times $2. So $200,000. Now the extra money you get, that's $23 times 100,000, goes into a new account with this long name, paid in capital in excess of that $2 par value for common stock. We're going to see a, maybe another account called preferred stock later on and it's related paid in capital in excess of par value. So here's the journal entry. Here's the cash we got. That's the uh, 100,000 shares times the $25 we got for selling each share or two and a half million. Now what goes into the common stock account, this equity account being credited, being increased with the credit, is that same 100,000 shares but timesing only by the par value of one share. So what goes into the common stock account, this is dollars now, is the total par value. Not the same as the number of shares now. Okay. Again, a lot of students confuse shares with the dollars represented in the common stock account or capital stock account. Now, if you only recorded these two dollar amounts, you're going to be unbalanced for debits and credits. So the extra we got over the two dollars, again, that's a hundred thousand shares, and the extra we got was twenty-three dollars. So if you extend this out, that extra, the excess over the two dollar par value for the common stock goes into this new account. Now, these two accounts here being credited are called paid in capital. The money being received from the um, owners is called paid in capital. We divide it up into two parts for par value and anything over the par value. So here's how it shows up on the um, stockholders equity section of the balance sheet. The common stock account is listed first. This is the total par value. Notice you list out the amount of shares. Uh, you have permission to sell, half a million. The actual shares sold, we call that issued. And we'll talk about what outstanding means in a few minutes. And then the extra you got over the par. And here's that old retaining retain earnings account. You add them all up, and here's the total equity. Again, these are called here paid in capital. And here is the profit we've been accumulating since the time we started our business minusing out any dividends we had paid out. So let's sell some more stock, but this time not by collecting cash, but getting land in exchange. And the land is worth that same two and a half million. But what goes into the common stock account is still the two dollar par value times the amount of shares issued. 
So basically the same journal entry except it's land being debited instead of cash. And again, common stock at par and anything extra over the par goes into paid in capital in excess of par value. Now, let's pay out some profits to our owners and that is called dividends. Dividends can be any asset the company owns, but the most common one and most what the shareholders like is money, cash. Now to pay out a cash dividend, of course you have to have cash in your business. If you don't have any cash, then you cannot pay out any cash. But you also have to have profits, retained earnings in the business. Okay, for probably for almost all corporations, you have to have profits to pay out a dividend. Otherwise, it may be a legal distribution or you basically are liquidating the business. In the case of a dividend, there's going to be three different dates you have to keep track of. Here is the date the board of directors get together and say we're going to pay out a dividend. That's called a uh, declaration date. And you have to own shares here on this future date called the date of record to be able to collect that dividend. And the actual dividend is not going to be paid out in a, f a further date in the future called date of payment. So here you can see in the boxes the declaration date and payment date require some type of recording of a journal entry. Whereas here the date of record, the date you have to own the shares to get a dividend, there is no journal entry required. So let's take a look at an example here. On January 19th, the Board of Directors is going to declare a dollar dividend for uh, 10,000 shares. The outstanding means what's in the hands of the shareholders. Yeah? So uh, $10,000 of dividends is going to be paid out. And the Board is saying this here on January 19th. So dividends are paid out of retained earnings. So the journal entry is to reduce retained earnings. Remember this is an equity account. Equity increase with credits and here we're decreasing it with a debit. Now we're not crediting cash here on January 19th. The cash is going to be paid out um, a month from now, well really two months from now, February 19th. Okay, So right now we owe $10,000 payable, common dividend payable liability and liabilities are increased with credits. So what happens on this February 19th, a month later? Well, you have to own the shares on this date to be able to collect the dividend. So if you sell your shares before February 19th, you're not going to collect the dividend. Okay, you have to own it on this date. So on February 19th, there is no journal entry required. Okay, no debit or credit. But now, a month later, when the dividend is paid on March 19th, we know paid, paid means cash credit, cash credit, and what we're paying is this liability that we had accrued back on January 19th. So we reduce the liability with a debit. Again, there's three different dates for a dividend. Declaration date, date of record, you got to own the shares on this date, and date of payment. And of the three, only two require journal entries. So let's pay out dividends again, but this time, well, we don't have any cash, or the company wants to keep its cash to grow its business. So to satisfy the shareholders who want something in their hand, what we're going to give them is more shares of stock, here called a stock dividend, shares in our own company. So we have a rule for small stock dividends and big stock dividends. A big one is when you increase the number of shares out there, outstanding shares, by 25%, more than 25%. And a small one is when it's 25% or less. Now in the case of a small stock dividend, you need to know the market value of your shares of stock. You also need to know, and it's going to be easy because we already should know it, is the par value of your stock. Market value means what it's trading for people buying and selling it on the stock exchange. Now in the case of a large stock dividend, you don't need to know the market value. You just need to know the par value like we had, I had mentioned up here for the small one. Okay? Both need the 
par value but the small one you need to have the market value so let's take a look at an example here's our uh, stockholders equity section of the balance sheet before a small stock dividend right now we have common stock with a dollar par value we have permission to sell 250,000 shares and right now what was sold issued is a hundred thousand shares again this is shares you multiply it by the what dollar per par value one share to get this total dollars in the common stock account and here's the actual we had received total paid in capital retained earnings okay so we know we're gonna pay out of retained earnings the profits and give more shares of stock to our stockholder now the amount of the dividend is always going to be stated in a percent here we're going to have two percent more stocks given so if you remember we have a hundred thousand shares two percent of this means two thousand more shares are going to be issued to the existing shareholders so if you own a hundred shares of stock the company is going to give you two more shares if you own a thousand shares of stock the company is going to give you twenty more shares here the total amount of shares going to be issued is 2,000 more shares and here is um, the market value we're told it's selling right now for ten dollars so what we're going to do is take out of the retained earnings a total of twenty thousand dollars but the amount that's going to be recorded for the common stock is always at par value so here's the additional shares again times the par value and the total amount eventually going in, going to go into the common stock account is two thousand dollars more now we're declaring this dividend on December 31st and we're not going to pay out the two thousand shares until next month on January 20th so here on this date we owe two thousand shares to our shoulders so here's another new account called common stock <clears throat> dividend distributable distributable two thousand dollars okay so eventually when you do pay out the shares on January 20th you're gonna debit to take it away and just um, credit the common stock account that we've seen before so if you only record this one and this one it's not going to be balanced with debits and credits so remember we have extra and the extra goes into that paid in capital again in excess of the par value of um, that dollar per share or here eighteen thousand dollars more okay. this is a stock dividend a small stock dividend where we have to take into account the market value we still work with the par but the difference here of nine dollars times two thousand shares goes into the excess um, paid in capital so let's change the well here's the the balance sheet of our company before and here is the balance sheet after it's eventually this 2000 distributable will move up into this common stock account up here when the shareholders actually get their money so the effect if you look at the total here and the total here it's the same but all we did is shift money from the retained earnings up here into the paid in capital section this is the same company before and after but now we have more shares, 102,000 shares representing the ownership in this same company versus just 100,000 shares uh, over here. Okay. So we're satisfying the psychological needs of our shareholders by giving them something. But really the company is still the same size. So let's take a look at an example of a large stock dividend. Here, our company, Router, permission to sell 200,000 shares. We actually sold 50,000. And again, we're going to move money from this retained earnings when you declare a dividend and put it up here in the paid in capital section. A large stock dividend is when it's more than 25%. So here it's 40%. So you look at your existing shares issued or outstanding times by that rate. So here's the additional shares you're going to be issuing. I believe in our homework assignment you're going to have a not 40% but 100% stock dividend. When you're dealing with a large stock dividend more than 25% what 
what you work with is only the par value. You ignore this market value here. You just work with the par. And whatever you multiply this out, this is going to be the amount eventually going into the common stock account, or in this case, distributable because we haven't paid it out yet, but we're taking out the amount from the retained earnings account with a debit. Okay, you only work with par when it's a large, and you work with par and the market if it's small, small meaning 25% or less. So something similar to a stock dividend is a stock split. You're giving more shares to the shareholders. So here's an example of uh, the existing company. We have 100,000, 100,000, just 100 shares issued, and each share has a par value of $10. So sitting in the common stock account should be $1,000 shares issued times par value total value total common stock account now what we're gonna do is take back these shares and give new shares to the shareholder again these are old shares so you have them redeem it and now you give them 200 shares you double the amount of shares they own but at the same time you reduce the par value by um, half the amount you doubled here and you half this amount. Sometimes they call this two to one. For every old one share, now you're going to own two shares. But the par value got cut in half. So when you multiply this $5 per share times the 200 shares, you still get the same total par value in the common stock account of $1,000. So in the case of a stock split, you do not need to journalize anything although you just have to note that the par value has gone down and the amount of shares issued has gone up but the total in the common stock account the dollar total par value is the same this was 10 this was um, what was it half right 25,000 but you doubled it and here you cut this in half so this number stayed the same before and after and none of the numbers are changing in a stock split you don't touch the retained earnings in a stock dividend you took money out of the retained earnings and you put it up here in the paid and capital section okay another type another class of stock remember we know common type all corporations have common but some corporations may want to have uh, a different class here called preferred. It's, here it says maybe a quarter of uh, companies, especially the large ones, have this preferred type of stock. Now in the case of very small companies, possibly a reason why um, they want to issue out preferred stock is they, they want to share the profits, the growth of the companies, probably with some family members but they don't want to give control of the company to those uh, members. When you have two classes of stock, common and preferred, common controls the company. Common gets to vote for those directors. Preferred shareholders, preferred stock, don't get to um, vote uh, for the board of directors. Now the reason why they call preferred stock preferred is because they get their dividends before the common shareholders. Or if the company were to liquidate, we know the creditors, the liabilities get paid off first, and the, and the equity owners, both common and preferred, get paid off second. But within the equity owners, preferred get paid off before the common. That's bo both for um, dividends and if you stop and liquidate the business. Now there's different types of preferred dividends. Here, one called cumulative means that you didn't pay off dividends you're supposed to have paid in past years. So now when you try to pay off the current year dividends, you have to pay off the old ones first. Here they call it unpaid dividends called dividends in arrears versus preferred stocks with non-cumulative dividends, 
if you didn't pay dividends in past years, well, that's gone, forgotten. You only have to worry about the current year preferred dividends getting paid off before now you can pay off or pay common shareholder dividends. So here we have an example, the two classes of stock, common and preferred. Notice we have par value and par value. We have authorized, we have authorized permission to sell, and we have the actual sold issued, both the same numbers, and outstanding, which we'll get into in a few minutes. Now in the case of preferred, you're given this rate. And if you remember, interest rates, just like when you have uh, money being borrowed or lent, the principal, which is the par value, times the rate equals the interest. Or in our case here, the principal times the rate equals the dividend each year. So if you own one share of preferred stock, you can probably expect to collect $9 of interest each year. So here we have 1,000 shares, so $9,000 of dividends, preferred dividends should be paid out each year before the common shareholders get any dividends. We're told that in 2011, no dividends were declared, no dividends were paid. So both common and preferred got nothing, no dividends in 2011. But in 2012, the board now declares a dividend of totaling 42000 for both preferred and common. Now again, preferred got to get there first, dividends first before common. But the question is, can the preferred get their 2011 dividends before the 2012 dividends are paid off? Well, it depends. It depends if the dividends are non-cumulative or cumulative. Non-cumulative means any unpaid dividends in past years is loss. So you only worry about the current year. Again, 9% times the um, par value, or 9,000 of dividends is paid off to the preferred shareholders, and the rest of the 43,000, is it 43? 43,000, 42,000 of dividends goes to the common. Whereas in the case of cumulative, you got to pay off the old unpaid preferred for past years, then the current year preferred dividends, leaving a smaller amount of dividends for the common shareholders. Again, that's the difference between cumulative and non-cumulative. Cumulative, cumulative you got to pay off the old unpaid preferred dividends before common gets their share. Um, here it says some other reasons for issuing preferred stock. Besides um, not giving up control, it may be easier to raise money by selling preferred. The reason why is because preferred stocks get their dividends first. Preferred stocks will get their money before common if you're a liquidated company. So there's less risk when you own preferred stocks, but less reward. Because if the company is very profitable, there would be more dividends going to the shareholder. The price of the common shareholder share price will increase faster than the preferred shares if the company is um, profitable. So let's say now the company wants to buy back some shares. So it typically would go into the open market like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ and just buy shares from existing shareholders. Here we're told the company, WIT, is going to buy back 2,000 shares of its own stock. We call this buying back treasury stock. Now when you buy things you would think this would be an asset and that would be true if you're buying stock of another company. But here our company is buying back its own shares of stock. Again that's called treasury stock and instead of treating it as an asset, we know assets recorded with debit, but treasury stock is a contra equity account. We know the equity accounts, common stock, preferred stock, paid in capital, retained earnings, all increase with credits. But here, when you buy back shares, you're buying stuff, maybe you got a debit cost, it's going to this contra equity account called treasury stock. It's going in not at par value, but at the cost you pay. And of course, here's the cash we had credited to buy it. 
So a treasury stock account goes in at cost, and now eventually when we sell it, it will come out at the same $4 per share cost. So here we're going to sell 100 of the 400 shares we had previously bought at a price bigger than our cost. So the cash we collect is $400, and the treasury stock being taken out, being reduced, is the same uh, oh, sorry, it's the same price that we bought at 400. So there's no gain or loss. In fact, if there was a gain, we got more cash than the cost. Gains in selling um, your own stock are tax-free. Now that again would not be true if you were dealing with another company's stock. But when a company deals with its own stock, buying and selling, there is no gain or loss reported. So let's say what would happen if you sold it for more than four dollars a share. Like here, we sold it for eight dollars, five hundred shares. Let's see, eight times five hundred gives us cash of four thousand. Now you take out the treasury stock. That's um, cost of four. Remember, go in at cost and come out at cost. Four dollars times five hundred, or two thousand. Now to equalize the debits and credits, the extra you got is not gain, but here, extra is paid in capital. In this case, a treasury stock, the extra two dollars, uh, four dollars per share. Okay, so no gain, but here paid in capital in excess of the cost of the treasury stock. So what would happen if you sold it for less than four dollars? Well, here we sold four hundred shares, and it still comes out. Um, let's see, four hundred shares at four dollars, right? Costs, and here's the cash coming in. 400 shares at a dollar fifty cents per share. So now you start using up that paid in capital that we had made in the uh, previous transaction when you had a gain. Now if you use up all this treasury stock paid in capital then you gotta start eating into your retained earnings if you start selling it at a loss. Um, uh, before we go into this uh, retained earnings, let me show you uh, the grouping of stock again. So here is the permission you got to sell stock. Again, we call that authorized. So let's say that this circle here represents all the authorized shares you can sell. But the actual amount you sold maybe is just a portion of this. This is called issued shares that you sold. Now we just saw you can buy back shares. Now what you buy back is coming from this issue. So let's chop this issue in, uh, in a part here. And the one you buy back is called treasury stock. So we have the number for authorized, that's this whole big circle. We have the number that was sold, that's this circle including the treasury. And now what's outstanding, that word we saw before, the number of shares is this right here okay? in the hands of the shareholder. This is in the hands of our company. What's in the hands of the shareholder is called outstanding, this part right here. Outside of our company, outstanding. Okay, So the numbers you'll see of shares is authorized, issued, and outstanding. Okay, So let's take a look at another account for stockholders equity, the retained earnings that we're kind of familiar with. So if you remember way, way back, probably in chapter two, we prepared the company's income statement and balance sheet and this statement of retained earnings that showed you the retained earnings at the beginning of the period and the end of the period and increased for net income or decrease if this was a net loss also decrease when you pay out the profits as dividends. Retained earnings is the amount that again you can pay out as dividends and if you pay out more than the retained earnings that's probably liquidating the company. Now when you enter into contracts with other people they may tell you hey you cannot pay out all your retained earnings we want to keep it as a reserve we're going to so-called appropriate it just in case something happens. Appropriated retained earnings means of this big retained earnings, 
This is the amount you got to keep in the company for whatever reasons people tell you to. Maybe you're expanding the business so you're saving these retained earnings or you're borrowing money and the lender says, hey, you can't pay all this out as dividends. You need to keep at least this amount. So here's the free so-called unappropriated, unreserved versus reserved retained earnings. If mistakes happen, not in the current year, which is easy to fix, but you discover mistakes in past years, that means the retained earnings for the beginning of um, your year, here it shows from the prior year, is probably incorrect. So what you do is do something called a prior period adjustment. Here there was a mistake of deducting equipment in past years. Remember we, when we buy equipment, you treat it as an asset and not an expense and you start to depreciate it and that's going to affect your profit and probably your taxes so here this figure is fixing up the retained earnings so here is the new retained earnings probably for at the beginning of your 2011 year now if you see lots of prior period adjustments being reported by a company that's probably an indication there's something wrong with that company at least the accounting system most times companies like to look good to show big profits and this would this example here just shows you the opposite of what, what had happened they showed less profits than they really should have okay, so you gotta watch out for companies that have lots of prior period adjustments so we're familiar with retained earnings again the beginning plus net income minus dividends but we also are want to show probably the change to the common stock account or the paid in capital. So all of this can be done in a consolidated statement called statement of stockholders equity. Again, this is similar to the retained earnings statement, this column here we saw before. But now when you look at this stock account, notice the column for shares. Again, this is pieces of paper. And here is the dollar amount in the common stock account. What connects the two is you multiply this by the par value for one share yeah, to get this. The most common mistake students make in this chapter is to, to use this as dollars. This is not dollars, this is shares. You got to multiply the shares by the par value or the stated value to get the amount that goes into the, the uh, common stock account as dollars. And when you add the paid in capital with the retained earnings, here's the total stockholder's equity. Stock options is not stocks. Stock options is the right to buy stock from the company. So one use of this is to give it to employees to motivate them to work hard so the company does well. So typically you would give them the option to buy stock at whatever price the stock is trading at right now. So let's say that the stock price is worth $10. So you give them the option to buy the stock at $10. But there's no motivation for the employee to buy the stock because if they buy it, they can sell it for $10 and they have to pay $10 for it. So what you want them to do is work hard to make the company profitable. So now the stock price increases in value. So let's say eventually maybe it increases to $50. And they have the right, the option, to buy it at this price of $10 when the option was first offered. So right now, the value they can get by selling, really to exercising their option, is $40. They buy it at 10 the stock, and they can sell it at the new high price. So again, you're trying to motivate employees to work hard for the company so the value goes up. And here's that old price they could have bought it at and continue to buy at. Okay. So very common for key employees, especially the officers of uh, big companies. Now one of the key financial ratios that you got to learn for this chapter is called EPS or earnings per share. We want to know the total profit the company made for one share of common stock. Here is the total profit the company made. Here is the profits that you have to pay dividends to preferred shareholders. So the difference between the two is the profits you're going to give to all of your sh uh, common shareholders. But again, we want the profit just for one share per share. So what we're dividing by here is the total number of shares um, outstanding, the average for the year. 
and for almost all our cases we'll be given this number for um, uh, for complex companies including stock options this is a hard number to figure out but we'll be given this number for almost all the problems we need to calculate so here is the answer the amount of earnings for one share of common stock and in theory this is the amount that can be paid out as a dividend from the current profits or most times they would keep part of this profits and grow the size of the company another factor another ratio is called price earnings ratio so here's that earnings per share we saw from the previous screen and we would divide that into the current market price the share one share of stock is selling for to get this ratio and a lot of financial analysts would use this ratio to determine whether they should buy a share of stock or sell it typically you wanna of course buy low when the market price is low and if you see potential of earnings increasing the price earnings ratio would be low and you would compare that to other companies price earnings ratio in the same industry and if anything else everything else is the same you wanna buy the one that is low because eventually you're hoping that the market price will go up based upon this growing profits here or maybe the price earnings ratio is very high indicating that you the price here is too high compared to a relatively low amount of profits being earned by the company okay a lot of it is subjective but when you compare one price earnings ratio of a company with another one in the same industry you can kind of tell which company is better which was the better buy or which what most people think is the better buy okay another ratio here is the value of one share of stock and you could invest this as any uh, share or you maybe you invest this in a savings account and here is the profit you're gonna earn could be interest or in the case of a corporation the dividend you get every year now if this was money being invested in a bank account you would get a measly less than half a percent at most interest up here and the dividend uh, or the interest yield would be very small so to make more money most people agree you should invest in the stock market and here's how much you have to pay for one share of stock and here's the amount of dividends you get for that one share of stock and the yield the percent is probably gonna be bigger than the yield you get on a savings account but you know the savings account value is not going to change whereas the stock market may increase which is good if you own the share of stock or decrease which may be bad and that's the risk you take for investing in the stock market the increase or decrease this is the main way you make money in the stock market hopefully with the increase in value and not necessarily collecting dividends but the dividends you do receive is probably going to be bigger than the interest you could collect in the same amount of uh, money invested with a bank account. One more ratio um, called book value. And we've seen this term used probably with the fixed asset, yeah? But the book value of one share of stock is basically, well, let's look at the accounting equation again. So here is the book value of all the shares of stock. Here the total stockholders equity on the top and we divide this by the number of shares outstanding during the year again we know what outstanding is yeah versus authorized versus issued okay and this will give you the value of assets minus liabilities for one share stock in theory if the company were to liquidate this is what you get by for owning one share of stock assuming that the assets are priced at the current value okay? Okay, so that's it for our chapter 11. Lots of terminology. Uh, so make sure you use your chapter as a reference. Okay, so work on your homework, the learn smart and the homework problems. Talk to you later. Mm -hmm.